be your presenter by today, and uh, I hope I can give you some information that you have not known or that you are interested in. So very welcome from my side. Uh, please note that the contents of these presentations are intended solely to present technical information. So they do not constitute legal advice and cannot replace legal advice. Uh, but of course, we make every effort to provide you with up-to-date information. Uh, but please note that we cannot be held reliable for its accuracy, completeness, and topicality. So I have three topics more or less today, uh, which will be first um, the restrictions under reach in this concerning articles. Then also um, I have included the pop regulation because uh, it is often underestimated that pop is also an important um, regulation with regard to articles. And in the third uh, part, I will shortly talk about SVHC components under reach. So why are we talking about harmful substances in articles? And why is it necessary to obey restrictions by reach and by pop regulations? First of all, and that is, I think, the most important thing is that these regulations are intended to protect uh, of humans, uh, human health and also the environment. That's why we are doing that, and that is the intention of the governments. And for you, it is important to obey the restrictions because you have to avoid penalties for non-compliance. In some uh, countries, it is a criminal act, for example, um, to not comply with uh, REACH Annex 17 of its pop regulation. And also, it is important to avoid recalls and stop of sales by market surveillance authorities due to not conformance and not compliance with the restrictions by REACH or by the pop regulations. So, what is REACH? I think many of you have already heard about that, but I would like to um, repeat it so that everybody is on the same page. So REACH is concerned with the registration, evaluation, authorization, and restriction of chemicals. And it aims to ensure a high level of protection to human health and the environment, as already mentioned. It further lays down provisions on chemical substances, which shall apply to be the manufacturer, also to the placing on the market, and the use of such substances on their own in mixtures or in articles, and to the placing on the market of mixtures. The today's focus of this presentation is placing on the markets of such substances in articles. What does it mean, restricted substances under reach? So there is a general provision which says a substance on its own in a mixture or in an article for which reach contains a restriction shall not be manufactured, placed on the market, or used unless it complies with the condition of this restriction. So you may know that, that in the EU reach, we have the Annex 17, and the Annex 17 contains uh, the restricted substances. So it gives information which substances are restricted in what kind of materials, mixtures, articles, and on the rest, uh, legal limits. So currently, uh, EU REACH contains 69 substances or groups of substances that are restricted. When you have a look into REACH next 17, you will say that there are 75 items, um, but um, six of them have been deleted because uh, some of them have to be shifted to other regulations and are no longer subject to the EU, EU REACH. And also UK REACH, which has taken over um, the Annex 17 to the uh, completely uh, as per, the, um, as per the, the status of the um, 30th or uh, 1st of, of uh, December last year. So also, UK REACH has a list of restricted substances, um, which you can find if you're following this uh, link. But if you have a look on into the uh, UK REACH uh, restricted substances list, you will see that only 74 
items are available um, as per the 30th of March this year. This is uh, um, the date when the list was uh, updated for the latest time at last. And um, the list, the EU uh, UK reach list contains 71 uh, substances or substance groups that are restricted. So there is already a difference and of course this difference will become greater. So what is the difference or what are the differences? So first of all, there are um, three entries which have been deleted in the EU reach, Annex 17, because this uh, entries, this substance or substances group have been transferred to the EU pop regulation. And this uh, deletion was done it was published um, by the middle of December, but it always takes 20 days until uh, after publication that uh, the, um, the um, change or the amendment is going to become in force. And that was, it becomes, in, to, uh, went into force in January and therefore it was not adopted by the UK. So first of all, we have entry uh, 2020, which is deals with pentachlorophenol. This is uh, not um, any longer um, uh, restricted by REACH, but by the POP regulation, but it's also part of the UK POP regulation. Um, so, and then we have this decabromo diphenyl ESA, DECA-BDE. This is also um, regulated by the UK POP regulation, uh, but it is now only regulated by the EU pop regulation and not longer part of EU, EU reach. And the same is valid for PFOA and the salts and related substances. So it's still in the UK reach, but not uh, any longer in the EU reach Annex 17. And there's also one entry, the entry 75, which has also been published by the end of 2020, but came into force only in January. So that certain substances concern certain substances for tattooing purposes. This entry is not listed in the UK reach currently. So there's already this deviation. Um, and of course, in future, the uh, divergent will become greater. So here are some plannings uh, for future restrictions, which uh, is different with, between the UK and the EU. So one of the projects, and this was published uh, on the 23rd of Feb March uh, this year, and you can find it when you're following the link, this deals with certain substances in tattoo inks and permanent makeup. And as I have just uh, mentioned, when I talked about the entry 75 of Reach Annex 17, this is already restricted in the EU. Uh, but what I do not know, but it's not clear at the moment, of course, whether um, the restriction which is planned now in the UK reach is similar to the restriction to the EU. So there could be differences. Another project which is um, in the UK as well as in the EU reach under development is uh, lead in ammunition or lead in project, uh, projectiles and fish tinkers and lures for outdoor activities. So there is the same initiative, but of course we do not know whether the restriction will be the same or uh, if there are difference, if there will be differences. And the third project, which is uh, under review and under development by the UK is concerning pair and polyfluoroalkyl substances, PFASs. So, um, some of the substances that belong to this group, such as PFOA, or also as PFOS, is already uh, regulated, um, either under REACH or under POP regulation. This is valid for the UK and for the EU. Um, but currently the EU is focusing on a, a further uh, kind of PFOS, this is uh, this undecafluorohexanonic acid in salts and related substances. So this is also PFAS, but this is a particular group with an PFAS. So there is, seems to be, or could be that there will be differences between the regulations concerning PFASs between the EU and the UK. 
Some further projects that are currently under approval in the EU is uh, one is uh, skin sensitizing substances in textile, leather, hide, and fur articles. And um, yeah, this uh, can. Um, the comments um, uh, starts already in 2008 in this project, and it is uh, estimated that this uh, regulation will become published within the next weeks, few weeks, few months. So it should be f nearly to the publication date, but I have no current uh, status, but it should be soon. This has a huge impact on the textile, leather, and uh, footwear industry. Uh, whether the UK will also follow this and will have a similar approach uh, is unknown at the moment. It's not on the planet currently. Also, there is a project concerning substances in single-use nappies under reach in the EU and also under microplastic, and there are several more. So, as you can see, there will be definitely differences. And now I would come to POP regulation. I have to mention the POP regulation already when I uh, talked about that some um, substances are either un regulated under POP regulation or under uh, REACH regulation or maybe in both regulations. So it is also important to talk about POP regulation. What is the POP regulation? I think many of you may, they, you all should know them, but it might be that you do not know them because REACH is more or less in the focus in the, in the front, but POP regulation is as important. The POP regulation is concerned with persistent organic pollutants. That's why it's called POP. And persistent means that are substances that will not be decomposed in the environment easily. So they will sometimes take years, hundreds of years, decades or centuries uh, until these substances will be destroyed by UV or by, or by um, light or by, by bacteria and so on. For example, we have the uh, perfluorinated substances, the PFIS is a very typical uh, example of substances that have never been in the, um, in the environment. It is completely artificial man-made, but they will survive uh, uh, centuries. So it, it's likely that you have Put what you put in the environment nowadays will be also there in 500 years. So that is what is POP is concerned with. And also it aims to protect human health and the environment from persistent organic substances. And it, the POP regulation is doing that by prohibiting phasing out as soon as possible or restricting the manufacturing, placing on the market and use of substances subject to the Stockholm Convention on POP. And it also deals with uh, this kind of substance, substances in articles. That's why I present it here. And there are two um, rules that are important, um, or two clauses that are important for, um, for articles, and that is um, that the manufacturing, placing on the market, and use of substances listed in Annex 1 uh, of the POP regulations either UK or um, EU doesn't matter, whether on their own, in mixtures or in articles shall be prohibited. And But there is an exemption, this shall not apply in the case of a substance present as an unintentional trace contaminant as specified in the relevant annex trees of Annex 1 or 2 in substance, mixtures or articles. So, what is pop UK pop regulation uh, com compared to EU pop regulation uh, with regard to articles? I have not considered everything else. I'm just uh, focusing on articles here. And it is to know that uh, UK pop regulation is based on the EU regulation uh, 2019 slash 1021. Uh, but the point is here that this regulation has been amended in the EU already. And um, the EU added um, the PFOA to the pop regulation, and that's why they deleted it in REACH, because it's now completely regulated in the pop regulation. And this has not been done by the UK so far, so that's why the PFOA is 
as well available in the POP regulation as also in the REACH regulation. Uh, sorry, uh, I'm sorry that I cannot tell you whether the, the UK will delete the PFOA from the REACH regulation in future. Maybe they will do it. Uh, and another regulation, amendment to the EU regulation, POP regulation, was published uh, at the beginning of this year, and this is concerns a limit for traces of pentachlorophenols in salts and esters in articles. Uh, because the POP regulation from 19, 20, uh, 2019 did not uh, give a limit for traces. So that would have meant that PCP was completely banned and should also not be there available in traces. But um, I think this, or many people think that was a mistake by the EU Commission, uh, by the ESHA. Uh, so they now have set up a limit for the traces of PCP of 5 mg per kg. Uh, but um, the UK POP regulation does not provide the limit of this, um, the trace limits currently. So maybe they will also follow the EU uh, or they will do something different. So this is again something where we have differences and uh, which may lead to problems and we'll see what will happen in the future with these regulations, uh, whether they will be diverged more in future. Finally, I just want also to um, talk about a little bit of substances of very high concern because also here articles are concerned. So what are SVHC substances of very high concern? So these substances are classified as cancerogenic, germ cell metagenic, reproductive, toxic, persistent, bioaccumulative, or toxic or endocrinic disruptors. They have not yet been restricted, so they are not banned. You can use them, um, but there are some information and notification obligations uh, accompanied. So you have to fulfill them although the substances can be used still in the UK as well as in the EU. And the, um, the substances are published in the candidate list and here are the links um, to the UK reach and the EU reach candidate substances list. What we can see already, there are already some differences because uh, the SVHC candidate list in the EU is updated every six months. And the latest update that was valid for the UK as well and was uh, also covered, is also not covered by REACH SVHC, um, is the latest, latest amendment which was made in June last year. So that means that the UK REACH SVHC candidate list contains 209 substances. Whether the EU REACH SVHC candidate list was amended uh, in January this year by two further substances as outlined here. So there's already a difference and currently eight further substances are under approval to be included in the candidate list of the EU reach in June or July this year. So then we will have differences in both um, candidate list and you have to um, deal with them. Um, when you're uh, set putting articles on the market in the EU as well as in the UK. Um, as I told you, there are notification obligations and information obligations. Uh, information obligations are the same at the moment, uh, but in concerning uh, the notification, there are some differences uh, in terms of where you have to upload the information. So what is similar is that any producer or importer of articles shall notify the HSE, the Health and Safety Executive in case of the UK or the ECHA, the European Chemical Agency in case of EU, if both the following conditions are met. So an SVHC is present in those articles in quantities totaling over one ton per producer and importer per year and the SVHC is present in those articles above the concentration of 0.1% by weight. This means if you are going to import this kind of articles, which cont uh, contains these substances in 
more than so that the, the amount of the substance is exceeding one ton per year, you have to inform either uh, the ECA or the HSE. And um, but this is only valid if this uh, substance is also have a concentration of more than 0.1 percent weight of weight. So you have not to sum up um, articles or amounts if the concentration is less than 0.1 percent. But if this uh, both preconditions are um, reached, then you have to inform either one of these organizations. Um, also, what you have to um, to uh, notify and to, to tell is quite similar, but of course you have to do it to different organizations. So you have to inform the HSE via the comply with your K reach IT system. And for ECA, you have to use another IT system. Um, the people who have to do that are the same, uh, either in UK or in uh, in the EU. So if you are in DB or an EU article producer, you have this obligation, or if you are an importer. And the list of information requires a notification of the identity and the contact details details of the GB producer importer, a registration number, if it is available, and the substance identity, and the tonnage range, and a brief description of the use of the substances in the articles and the use of the articles. This is quite similar for the EU, but here you have to inform ECA via the REACH IT platform. Also, same group of, of uh, people have to um, to do that, and um, also the first uh, three um, points in the second part are the same. Um, but here they are also asked that they call it substance classification and substance use. You have to inform the ECA about, and also the tonnage range. So this is quite similar, but and uh, you have to use the same format, the IUCLID format, but you have to uh, do it twice um, on different IT platforms. So I will come to the conclusion now. Conclusion is that EU and UK restrictions on harmful substances uh, are still largely coincident, but however, they have started to diverge in terms of restricted substances and SVHG. So you need to have strategies um, to um, if compliance with UK and EU regulations is required. So you have to think about how you can meet both requirements if you are going to import or to export to both countries or respectively areas. So that is what I wanted to tell you about today. Thank you for your attention. And now if you have any questions, please feel free. Thank you, Benedict. Um, thanks for sharing your knowledge and expertise on that subject. Um, while we've got a few minutes, shall we run through a few questions? Um, let's go with one here. So um, somebody's asking, uh, what can be the strategy to comply with UK as well as with EU restrictions on hazardous chemicals? I think what is important, you have to find out the lowest limit. So if you comply with the lowest limit of one region, uh, you also should be in compliance with the other region. So that is, uh, I think, one point that you really have to think about um, the, the limits. And also, of course, you have to, to check um, whether one uh, area, one country or one, one group of countries have uh, stricter re restrictions. If you fulfill them, that's also fine for the other country. But of course, you need to be aware and you have to compare and you have to be up to date um, what what is going on so that you can comply with both systems. Okay, great. Um, and um, can you cover EU SCIP and UK equivalent? Um, sorry, I didn't didn't get. That's okay. Can you cover? Oh, sorry, my screen's moving. Can you cover EU SCIP, skip, and UK equivalent? Uh, I 
don't know at the moment. I let let's um we will answer uh, this this um question later. What we are going to do, we will share uh, questions which come in which you cannot answer today. We will let you all know about the answers of this question. So maybe no, can, no problem. We can cover that off afterwards. Um and how will work. How will this work? Um, the update of a UK candidate list. Um, will this be similar to the ECHA updates? Uh, I think there will be something similar. Um, so that there's also a commission who is going to decide um, whether some substances needs to be uh, added to the candidate list. Yes. Okay, lovely. Um, and let's just go to one more then before we finish. Um, is any centralized standard of restriction in most stringent way, which will come, which will compliance with all region requirements? Um, let's see, let me I think uh, that this is a, a question. So we will provide such information so that we can uh, give you the information of whether there are different requirements and so that you comply with us. If you use us as a service provider, for example, for ensuring for your diligence testing or for ensuring that your um, um, articles comply with the restrictions, for example, that you ask us for testing. Of course, we will have a look on both and we will tell you whether uh, you meet the requirements in both countries and if there's additional uh, uh, requirements. That's what is, our service uh, is included. Okay, that's lovely. Thank you. We've got quite a lot of questions coming through. I think I'm quite conscious of time. So what we'll do is we'll uh, look through the questions and we will obviously get back to you and answer all of those questions directly. Um, so thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we will be sending you a copy of the presentation and the recording. Um, we do have another webinar. Um, it's uh, analysis of footwear and apparel recall cases, which is is taking place on the 12th of May. Um, so um, if you head to our website, you can find all of the details there in the resource centre. Um, and please get in touch with us and let us know if there's any other subjects that you'd be interested in hearing from us. And we always like to know um, what you're interested in and hearing about. So um, feel free to get in touch with us. So on behalf of myself and our presenter today, thank you very much for your time and enjoy the rest of your day. Also, have a good day from my side. Thank you for attending the webinar. Goodbye. Thank you. Bye-bye.